About 30 or 35 years ago, there were a lot of new pieces of legislation coming in, into place. In the United States, there was the Animal Welfare Act, there was the Marine Mammal Protection Act, uh, the Endangered Species Act a little later. Uh, on, on the international level, there were treaties and different laws in other countries that started to make it more difficult for zoos to acquire animals from the wild. But the zoos still wanted to have showcase animals. They still wanted to have tigers. They still wanted to have bears. They still wanted to have all of these animals that the public came to see. So what they started to do is to get together and breed animals to replenish the supplies that they already had because they were having difficulty getting more from the wild. And that breeding eventually morphed into conservation programs. And that change, that, that morphing into a conservation programs, occurred along with increasing criticism of zoos. And it was bolstered. Every zoo in the world jumped on the conservation bandwagon because of a very small number of very limited successes. Now, there are three reasons, three major reasons why I think zoo conservation is a myth. They are capacity, biology, and return on investment. I'll tell you a little bit about all three. The first is capacity. For any of you who read any of the zoo literature, there's a fellow by the name of William Conway. He was the uh, director of the Bronx Zoo, which later became the Wildlife Conservation Society. And he's sort of like the godfather of the American zoo movement. And he did a little uh, estimate on zoo exhibits. And he had determined that all of the uh, major zoos in the world could, if you collectively put together all of their animal environments, the actual physical space that the animals inhabit, that, that they would probably fill the borough of Brooklyn. He then took that space and he tried to figure out, theoretically, how many species could you save, at least on a temporary basis, by keeping them in captivity. And it came up, I can't remember, remember the exact number, but, but it was something like in the neighborhood of 800, 850 species. I think that number is, is sort of a, a little bit of a pipe dream, because if you look at zoos around the world, they all have they have different formats. Some are commercial, some are public, some, some are aquariums, some are this, some are that. We have insectariums. There's all different kinds of zoos. If you look at the example of the Spix's macaw, one of the, the four big blue parrots that's the most critically endangered, there's about 50 or 60 left. The last one disappeared from the wild in 2001. You, you would think that all the people who own these parrots, the zoos and the private collectors, would get together and, and want to save the species. Well, that's impossible. They can't get together. They're always bickering and arguing, and it's almost in, uh, assured that the Sphinx's macaw will become extinct as a result. I think maybe, maybe in an optimistic scenario, you could look at 250 or 300 species. So you may say, well, that's good, 250 to 300 species. But consider this. There's 12,000 zoos in the world. On the low end of the scale, their annual operating budget, according to the Zoo Inquiry, which was published in 1994, is about $14 billion a year. That doesn't include capital projects. They take up millions of person hours of time and energy. And the extinction rate, I was reading something from the IUCN a couple of days ago, the extinction rate for species is estimated to be three to five species per hour. So when you're thinking, 800 to 850 species, theoretically, according to Conway, or more realistically, maybe 250 to 300, and you're looking at the resources that would have that production, it just doesn't really make sense. And what happens in a lot of the conservation breeding programs is they're starting off with very small founder populations, many of them less than 100 members, and not all of those members are actual breeding animals. So you're starting off right from the get-go with a very small population that possibly is already inbred. A lot of the SSP programs have less than 100 animals in them, and a lot of the breeding programs in other parts of the world have less than 100 animals as well. Another fact to consider is that only about 10% of the global number of zoos actually participate in any kind of breeding programs at all. So you've got a very small percentage of zoos that are actually engaged in any form of, of breeding. 
what's coming out now in a lot of the scientific literature, some of it related to fish farms, is all about this rapid evolution of animals in captivity. Animals that end up over many generations probably not even being like the animals that they started with. And that's because captivity has none of the normal influences of the wild. So all of the factors that impact on the survivorship of a particular animal or group of animals in the wild, they don't exist in captivity. Now, that study I mentioned earlier, the zoo inquiry, found that generally speaking, it's 100 times more expensive to keep an animal in captivity than it is to preserve that animal in its natural habitat. And that study, that, that paper, the zoo inquiry, looked at one particular animal, and it's an animal that's pictured on the screen, the black rhinoceros. And they found that for a black rhino, that it cost about $1,000 a year to protect a black rhino in its natural habitat. It cost about $16,800 a year to protect uh, or keep a black rhino in a zoo. And they wanted to take this one step further. They, they took a population of black rhinos in US zoos, and I don't know if it's the total population or not, but they took 16 black rhinos. And the cost, the maintenance cost, was estimated to be about uh, $269,000 a year for those 16 black rhinos. And they wanted to find out what would you get if you protected rhino habitat in the wild, if you applied the same dollars. So they found an example of, of rhino habitat. It wasn't like they searched out a particular example. They just picked one that had the same budget for uh, a natural situation. And it was Garamba National Park in Zaire. Say, OK, you've got 16 black rhinos over here in the zoo. Some of them are probably unhealthy. They're probably not breeding. They're not doing well. They're not really the, the hope for the species. You've got Garamba National Park over here. What do you get over here for $269,000? Well, you got 31 rhinos. So you've automatically, in terms of rhinos, and it was a different species, it was a white rhino, so it wasn't black rhino, but you got a, almost a doubling right off the bat of the numbers of rhinos that you're protecting. Well, in Garamba National Park, you also get 4,000 elephants. You get 30,000 buffalo. You get the entire giraffe population of Zaire. You get 14 ungulate species, 10 primate species, 93 small mammal species, all of the birds, all of the invertebrates, all of the other creatures and life forms that live in that area, which comprises 429,000 hectares of land. You get the economies of all of the villages around the park that depend on the park for their livelihoods. So to me, when you're thinking, I'm investing my dollars into conservation, should I put it into the 16 rhinos over here, or should I put it into the natural situation over here? There's one other return on investment thing I want to tell you about. Every year, I add up capital projects and zoos that come across my desk over a four-week period, and I don't seek them out. I, mentioned, I think I mentioned earlier, I get a ton of emails every day, and a lot of them are, you know, St. Louis Zoo building a new penguin exhibit, $10 million. This zoo's building that, this zoo's building that. I did this last year, tallied up one month, it added up in capital projects to $1.213 billion. When you look at return on investment, think about what that could possibly do if even a small amount of that were applied to the wild.